a sermon podcast for Palm Sunday 2020 by Nicholas Henshaw. A prayer for this Palm Sunday which speaks profoundly both to the journey of the Holy Week ahead and indeed to the times we live in. Living God, deliver us from a world without justice and a future without mercy. In your mercy establish justice and in your justice remember the mercy revealed to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today we begin this extraordinary journey, the journey through the last days and hours of Jesus' life. And on Palm Sunday, we hold together two narratives on this journey. The most obvious, of course, is Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. Or, or, or if you read Matthew's text carefully today, two donkeys but we'll leave that detail for another time. So that, on the one hand, triumph. Here comes the king. Here comes the king. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And on the other hand, is the account of the passion, the death of Jesus, the death of the Messiah. These texts are in an extraordinary conversation. On the one hand, triumph. On the other, in a way that all the Gospels speak of. The discovery that the triumph of this king, the kingdom Christ inhabits, is an upside-down kingdom, where the first to last, the last first, and the greatest is the servant. A kingdom where the Messiah finds the only way to show his love is through his death on the cross. So a day of paradox, a week of paradox, where the victory that we see turns out to be an upside-down victory. And after all, how could it be different? For that is indeed the nature of the kingdom of God, which the Lord places at the centre of all his teaching in the Gospels. How do we enter into this? What does all this have to say to what we are living through now? This wide gap of time, when we haven't yet been able to make room in our heads, our hearts or our lives, for the impact of this worldwide pandemic. This is, I would suggest, precisely what Holy Week speaks to. The God we know in Jesus Christ has come precisely to harrow the reality of what it means to be human, to harrow the hell of our humanity, to use traditional language, to enter into all that it means for God to share our life, to be found in human form. Recognising our darkness and leading us into light. And of course, God's manner of doing this is only through the cross. Or rather, through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Not two separate events, but a single saving event through which God is saving the world. Of course, we know the betrayals of Judas, the betrayals of Peter, the absence of the apostles at the cross. And yet at the cross, we also know that the crucified God is gazing at us with great love, gazing at us with great love and inviting us to share in the upside-down kingdom of his victory. There is a word used again and again in the Passion Narratives, an ordinary word, handed over. 
For the gospel writers, it's clearly an important word that locates something very significant about what happens to Jesus through these days. Pilate hands Jesus over to be crucified. And Judas is rarely called traitor in the Gospels, though that is what he is. Instead, he is frequently called the one who handed him over. It's used in the Gospels almost as a title for Judas, a bit like Thomas the twin. So for these Gospel writers, for these eyewitness accounts, the handing over of Jesus is a crucial event in this series that leads to the cross. And indeed Matthew, along with the other evangelists in different ways, spells this out in his texts. Pilate hands over Jesus to be crucified, he says. Jesus is moving from a place where action is possible to a place where action is no longer possible. From a place of capacity a word used again and again of Jesus in the Gospels, to a place of incapacity, from a place of freedom in his ministry, to a place where that freedom is utterly constrained. And that, after all, is what the word passion means. When we use the phrase passion narrative to describe the accounts of the death of Jesus, passion does not mean strong feelings, Rather, it comes from a word meaning being done to, as in the words patient or passive. So this is an account of Jesus being done to. And it is precisely there that I think the promise lies. For we find ourselves handed over. We find ourselves being done to. We find ourselves unable to act, incapacitated, even unable to go out of our houses, let alone gather for worship. And we know that that is the nature of the kingdom of God, that we find ourselves constrained. Yet in that constraint, that incapacity, the Lord's journey to the cross, our journey to the cross, his being handed over, are being handed over, being laid aside, stripped down, having to face our triviality. There God says, this is not the final word. Indeed, God shows us that this is what the journey to glory looks like, the place where we go deeper with God. I was in Ethiopia in 1985 during the great East African famine. Some 10 million people were on the verge of starvation in Ethiopia alone. Even in that context of multiple overwhelmings, where millions of lives hung in the thread, the Bishop of Gonda led a pilgrimage to the rock-hewn churches of Lalibela. And as they gathered in their tens of thousands in that bare landscape, he said simply, There is no place so dark that we cannot sing praise. There is no place so dark that we cannot sing praise. That is the invitation of this Holy Week, to know that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. A prayer from 1400 years ago by the great Irish monk Columbanus. Kindle in our hearts, O God, the flame of love which never ceases, that it may burn in us, giving light to others. May we shine forever in your temple, set on fire with your eternal light, even your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our Redeemer. Amen.